everybody. Good morning. Welcome to our morning meeting with our ambassadors. We're here this morning with Fern. She is our sweet female barred owl ambassador. Um, so I'll give you guys a second to come in and then we'll tell you all about her story. She's very, very sweet. Um, she has been with us for about um, a year and a half now. She's a really, really good girl. Um, and she has some exciting news today. So, um, so come on in. Let me know that you're here. Uh, type your name and let me know where you're from and I'll give you guys a shout out. Um, good morning, everyone. Hi, Katie. Good morning. We're here with Fern. Hi, Fern. I know. Um, good morning from Andover, Connecticut, Kathy. Hello. Um, yeah, so we are going to get started in just a sec. I'll let everybody kind of tune in. Good morning uh, from Wyndham. Jessica, good morning. Uh, yeah, so barred owls are very common. This is probably one of the owls that we've seen the most. If you guys have been lucky enough to see an owl, it was probably one of these guys, especially in our area. Good morning, Willow from Greenville. Good morning from Florida. Hello, Andy. I'm not sure if you guys have barred owls in Florida. I don't think they extend that far south, but you'll have to let me know if I'm wrong. Um, good morning, everybody. We're here with Fern. She's our beautiful barred owl ambassador. Fern is uh, one of two barred owls that we have here at the center. She is our female. We do have a mated pair named Byron and um, his... Uh, her her mate's name is Byron. He's very, very sweet, and he's been with us for uh, over 13 years now, so a uh, very, very good boy. Fern um, has been with us for just about a year and a half now. Um, she is Byron's second mate. His first passed away a few years ago, um, but they do like to live in pairs, so we were able to um, to keep Miss Fern here and give him a companion and the two of them are going to be having um, a very special uh, little friend join them today so we're really really excited for them. Good morning Xander, hello. Uh, Kathy, these are the ones that you will hear so frequently calling um, in our area. They are very very vocal, very chatty. Uh, barred owls are known for saying something that sounds like who cooks for you, who cooks for you all. Um, so that is definitely a common thing to hear. Um, I'm going to flip the camera so that you can just see her because I know that she's, um, she's who we're here to see this morning. Uh, but she is very, very sweet. And, um, if you guys have any questions about barred owls or about any of the patients or animals that we have here at the center, please let me know and I'll be happy to, um, to answer your questions. Good morning, Jennifer and Alexa, New Hampshire. Good morning, Nevitz and Nashua. Uh, okay, so we're flipping the camera around. Hi, good morning, Fern. Good morning. Uh, so Fern is, um, you know, a, an owl, so she is nocturnal, and she is might look a little sleepy during our presentation. You know, on a program, she would usually be pretty alert, pretty aware of what was going on, but since it's just the two of us out here by our beautiful little pond um, back here, she's kind of just enjoying enjoying the, sea the scenery. She doesn't really know she has an audience, which I think is really cool because it means we can get a little bit closer to her. They're really calm. They don't seem to be stressed at all about just the fact that there are 40 people watching, which is really cool. Uh, good morning, Charlie in South Portland. Our ambassadors certainly are very good at going out on programs. They, um, they are used to it and have adapted very well to the life of a uh, of a, a superstar, but um, but I'm sure that this is a very pleasant way for her to spend her morning. So if she looks sleepy at all, it's just because she is an owl. She is a nocturnal animal. So owls are, of course, famous for their ability to hunt at night. They are uh, incredible night hunters because of their uh, great vision. They can see very, very well in low light vision. And they also have a fantastic hearing that allows them to hear tiny little rodents and um, animals around on the forest floor that they can then go pluck up. So they are very, very good night hunters. Hi, Miss Fern. You look so thrilled to be awake with this morning. Uh, she is very sweet. So Fern came to us um, because of a car collision. This is something that happens to us 
all the time. So uh, yes, Charlie, she was injured. Um, she came to us after she was hit by a car a couple of winters ago. Um, she was a juvenile bird at the time. So she was probably less than, you know, a, a full year old and uh, was probably struggling to get through the winter. Sometimes first year birds have a hard time learning, figuring out how to hunt and get through the winter successfully. And they might go to places that are easier sources of food than, um, than hunting in a, in a forest or in a typical setting. So they might go to a roadway or, um, or something like that. And this little lady was unfortunately hit by a car and um, in, rather than the normal kind of wing injuries that we see from that, she did sustain an injury. Um, she did unfortunately get hit in the head and has some neurological damage now. So this is not normal for a barred owl. They should not be contentedly sitting on the glove, enjoying the surroundings with a human sitting right next to them. I mean, she's literally attached to me. And uh, a normal barred owl, a wild barred owl, would be freaking out. They would not be enjoying that. And um, this brain injury that she has really... Uh, kind of just made her unafraid of people. She doesn't seem to be very much aware of what's going on around her. Um, we're not uh, convinced that she would be able to avoid predators on her own in the wild or that she would be able to hunt or have the wherewithal to, you know, stay away from um, from other, other larger owls or people. So unfortunately, she does live with us now. Um, she is still fully flighted. She can get around when she wants to. Sorry, the mayflies are a little crazy, huh? Um, so she can get around. She can still preen herself. Um, we give her food um, every night in the form of dead mice, and she can still go get those. So she's still able to care for herself, and uh, Byron also helps with that too. But um, but she, unfortunately, cannot be released with that head injury. So she just has some neurological damage that's pretty severe. Um, and Byron, of course, lives with us because of a wing injury. So he is unable to fly. Um, good morning, Ryan. Hello. What night bird makes wish sounds? Like a wish? I'm not sure. Um, we have lots of different types of, um, of owls that live around here that might make it us, us, a lot of different owls will make like high pitched screech noises, like screech owls will make that sound. Um, so I'm not sure who makes a wish sound. Um, that's a good question. It could also be um, a different species. That's not an owl. Uh, these guys are known for saying, who cooks for you, who cooks for you all, which sounds kind of like a um, and that they're very, very noisy. Um, Andy just looked up, they do have barn owls in Florida. So Andy, she is a barred owl, which is often confused with bar, barn owls. She is called a barred owl because of these bars and stripes on her feathers. Barn owls are of course called barn owls because they do typically live on farms and in barns and structures and things like that. And they are two different species of owls. So I'm not sure if barred owls live in Florida. You'll have to see that one. Uh, thanks, uh, Ricky from Texas. Thank you so much, Kathy, for donating. That's, um, and Louise for donating. Thank you so much. Um, both of these ladies have taken advantage of that donation button. We are so, so sweet. Uh, we are so grateful for you guys. Um, and the donations that, uh, you guys give to these videos to all of our online, um, Facebook donation pages all go right to the care of these guys, help to pay for their mice, help to pay for their care, um, keep them, keep them well fed and well cared for. Um, they, it also helps to take care of all of the patients that we have in our clinic. Um, I just added it up for our director yesterday. And, uh, since, um, in the last two months, we've taken over 230 animals. So we are definitely in the in the glut of spring. We have been receiving lots and lots of calls about baby squirrels, baby mice, baby chipmunks, baby birds, all sorts of things. We have lots of ducklings right now, lots of baby squirrels. So uh, we are definitely going. The other baby that we have that's very exciting, we have a small little barred owlette. <sighs> You have a fly on your eyelash, honey. We have a small little barred owlet 
in our clinic. Um, some of you guys may have read on another post this morning that we did have a, a, a second one that passed away, but this one that we still have is doing really well and is doing so well that it will be able to go out into the enclosure with Byron and Fern in a little crate to start out. And then once it gets big enough, it'll be out in the enclosure flying around with them. And Byron and Fern will actually be able to help us to foster this baby Owlette. And Fern here has been with us for a year and a half. And as far as we know, this is her first baby. Um, she's never fostered with us before. She has never had that opportunity. So we're really excited to see how that goes. So today, Fern is actually getting her first little baby. Um, and we're really excited to see uh, just how she responds to it. Uh, we're not sure what her response will be. We'll be closely, closely supervising them. We have cameras um, that we use to watch them when we first put them in because it is a little bit... Um, a little bit nerve-wracking so we'll be we'll be closely monitoring Fern and Byron. Byron is a veteran uh foster dad. He's a wonderful foster dad. He and uh his previous mate Bianca fostered a lot a lot of babies. So we um we're looking forward to him getting that opportunity again. And Miss Fern, it's your first time foster mama. I know. We're so excited. Um this baby has been doing really well. It's just a little bit healthier and um, has been growing at the pace that we like to see. So we're excited to be able to put it out in there. And um, we'll give you guys updates as that's going on. We do still have our two great horned owlet babies that are in with Galileo and Gaia. They are doing very well. They're running around or, you know, starting to jump around in their enclosure. They're doing wonderfully. So it's an it's owlet season. Uh, good morning, Louise. Thank you so much again for donating. Uh, Andy says they do, um, they do have, uh, Bardell's. Oh, Michelle has a flight wish sound. Okay. I under, I think I understand. Um, so if you ever listen to, uh, the way that morning doves, when they fly, they make a sound with their feathers. Um, that is usually a morning dove. So if that's, I think what you're talking about. That is, um, that is a morning dove. Thank you so much, Kathy. Hello. All right. Thank you guys so much for your kind words. Um, yeah, so we're very excited to be able to uh, take some pictures once that baby gets in there. Of course, once the baby does go in, we try to limit our contact with them as much as we can. But um, through the camera, hopefully we can pull some recording and see how they get along. I'm really excited for that. I'm really sorry for all these flies, Miss Fern. She's like, yeah, this stinks. Maybe if we move a little bit. You want to move? Okay. We're going to we're gonna relocate. So some of these flies maybe don't have as good an opportunity. I know. That's better. Yeah. Uh, Nevitz, these guys have a fairly long lifespan. Our owls, um, typically, and our raptors, the rule is the larger the bird, the longer the lifespan. So an eagle or a great horned owl could live to be around 40. Uh, these guys in captivity have been known to live up to um, almost 30. And then in the wild, they would live to be in their late teens. So um, they can live quite a long time in, um, in captivity, quite a bit longer. There you go. What do you think? Is that better? Not as many flies? She's like, oh my God, thank you. Thank you so much, Jillian, for donating. That's so sweet of you. We really, really appreciate it. Um, all of the support will go to take care of these guys. Hello. Um, good morning, Amory um, and Willow. Her eyes are adorable. What's cool about um, barred owls is they're one of the few owl species that have these all dark chocolatey brown eyes. So it's really hard to actually see the difference between like their pupil and their iris because their eyes are such a dark brown color. Um, most owls have that typical cat eye that's really good for, um, for hunting and for night vision. These guys are known to hunt in, um, in, you know, in dusky times, in, um, in a little bit lighter times. So they don't have that big, um, those big yellow orange eyes, but they do have still some amazing, amazing low light vision. So they are very, very good at seeing when it's very dark outside. Um, 
They also have exceptional hearing, so Miss Fern here can hear a little mouse scurrying around on the ground really well. Um, and they do a wonderful job of catching their food when they are um, when they are hunting in almost complete darkness, which is really cool. Let's step up, step up. I know she's like, no, I was having a good time. I know, I know. Okay. Let's go back over here. Hi. Um, something else that you might notice is that Fern is actually molting at the moment. So she is uh, dropping some of her feathers. She has been uh, dropping feathers all over her enclosure. Um, and that is because in the winter, these guys are actually growing in thick, thick coats to help them to, um, to get through the winter. They stay here all winter long. And those thick coats of feathers will actually help them to, uh, to stay uh, warm and toasty when they are out here in the winter. So Miss Fern is molting at the moment. She is um, she's dropping these downy feathers that you see under here. And, um, and Kathy, they do even have little tiny mini feathers on their eyelids. They also have these little feathers around their beak called uh, rictal bristles that help them to feel uh, what's going on around their beak to help them hi to help them to feel when um, when something is around their beak that helps them to uh, kind of judge what's going on there they don't have very good depth perception in that area so they can't really see uh, what's going on there so they have these little bristles kind of like a cat's whiskers to help them to feel what is going on around that area around their beak um, so they have a lot a lot of little tiny tiny feathers in this area they also have the circle of feathers around their eyes so you can kind of see they have one around each eye and that circle is really good for um for helping them to pick up on sounds so when they um are hearing uh, in the woods hearing something on the ground what they'll do is they'll point their face down towards the ground and um, The sound that they're hearing the sound waves will come up and will bounce off of that circular um, Disc of feathers and go right into their ears and that helps them to uh, Kind of tune in on sounds that they're hearing it helps to magnify sounds So it's similar to when we cup our ears if someone is um, is saying something and we can't hear them cupping our ears helps to catch some of those sound waves so they have the same function which is really cool um hello deborah good morning hello michelle hello theo it's nice to see you guys we hope everybody is staying safe good morning if anyone has any questions about fern i would be happy to answer them they are a wonderful um a wonderful example of our beautiful um and they are definitely definitely moving around and chatting right now they've probably quieted down in your area a bit they um they are normally very talkative around march and april when they are nesting um when they're first coming back to their nesting sites and um coming back to their to their mates they do a lot of calling to get in touch with each other and um, these guys are no exception they did a lot of calling in March and April now they've probably quieted down a bit but soon you may hear the tiny little um, kind of screeching calls of the babies um, the begging calls can sound uh, quite quite creepy sometimes actually it's kind of like a similar it's an odd it's an odd sound um kathy her ears are actually located um right behind that ring of feathers there she's not gonna let me touch her with this camera in my hand but um she has ears that are right kind of behind that ring of feathers right next to her eye and they are actually very very large ears they are um very uh similar in shape to our ears they have that shell shape that round conch shell shape and um they are pretty large they're even bigger than her eyes and they have this flap of skin uh that goes over them to keep uh debris and things out um, but they're quite big and then um they are actually off centered a little bit so she typically she has one that's kind of down a little bit lower than her eye on one side and then one that's up above her eye on the other side and this allows her to pinpoint sound and triangulate sound very very well so she can um can tell if a sound is coming from below her or above her based on which side of her face 
uh, the sound was coming from. Let's see, we have some good questions. Louise, how fast do they fly? And do they go back to the same nest and how many babies? Okay, so they are not super speedy flyers. They are not um, nearly as fast as a falcon or anything like that. They're not really evolved for speed, uh, but they can um, fly completely silently through the woods. So they are able to navigate through the forest uh, without making a sound. So at night, that's really useful. They don't wanna wake up um, or scare off their predators. It's usually quite a bit quieter at night. And they do this by flapping their wings a little bit less excessively. And then also they have this, um, this really amazing edge to all of their feathers called a fluted edge. So you can see it looks like the teeth of a comb. And that is able to cut up a lot of, cut up on the sound a lot because it helps to keep wind from making a lot of noise running through their feathers that kind of disperses that that wind um so they can fly very very quietly but not super fast they do return to the same general area owls are famously not known to nest they don't build nests they more often will use a tree cavity so a hole in a tree that someone has um that someone has you know pecked there a woodpecker um and then they will sometimes line the bottom of that nest with some feathers, but they don't typically make too many um, adjustments to that hole. They will, um... hi Miss Fern, hello. They will, uh, they will usually occupy a hole in a tree and, um, and then, can you look this way? Good girl. And then they will, uh, they will use that as their nest, but they don't typically, build their own nests. Um, and they don't need to necessarily return to the same uh, hole, the same cavity. They will, you know, return to the same general area. And then they'll have somewhere between like three and five babies, maybe um, two or three of them will make it through to the point where they, um, they are nestlings or I mean, um, branchlings and can come out of the nest. And then um, unfortunately, there is quite a bit of infant mortality, and it usually within a year, one of those babies will will make it. Um, so that's why they have up to five, up to that many. Uh, let's see, Ben. Asa says, why do I need to wear a glove? That's a really good question, Asa, a very practical question. So owls are in the family of birds called the raptor family. Raptors all have these incredible talons. I'm not sure how well you can see those, but these talons are very, very sharp and pointy. Talons are what we call their feet. So their whole foot is called the talon and they have sharp claws on them that if I were wearing, uh, weren't wearing a glove would definitely hurt <laughs> um, if they were just right on my hand. Um, maybe not so much right now because she's pretty um, gently resting on my hands, but if she decided to clamp down, owls and raptors are famous for their grip strength so they can squeeze those talons really, really tightly and hold on to their prey really well. And um, unfortunately, that would mean my hands would get pretty damaged. So that is why we wear the gloves so that I can walk away from this unscathed because <laughs> she does have those amazing, amazing talons that are very good at catching uh, prey. In the wild, these guys typically would like to eat things like um, small rodents and then their favorite foods are in the amphibian family actually. So they love to eat frogs, salamanders, um, newts, things like that. Um, they love anything that can come out of a vernal pool. So these little um, ponds or pools that we get that fill up with rainwater temporarily and then dry out throughout the course of the summer are really, really great for amphibian life. You might see a lot of tadpoles right now running around in those. We have a bunch in this little pond back behind me. Um, so these guys love to eat all of those, uh, those frogs that come back to those pools for mating season in the springtime and that helps them to feed their babies. It turns out that they're, they kind of time their nesting perfectly so that when they need to feed those big babies, there are a bunch of little frogs around. Um, let's see. Yes. So Jessica, they do nest in dead tree cavities. Yep. Um, these guys are cavity nesters and uh, what's kind of surprising about that is that you might not think that she would fit into a cavity of a tree, but she's mostly feather and she's about half as large as she looks because she is covered in such a thick, uh, 
coat of feathers. Are you sticking up so you can see? She's kind of flamingoing it right now. Good girl. Uh, but all of this is fluff, and she can actually slink down into a tiny little um, hole in a tree if she wants to, especially in the winter. That's great for keeping her warm. Um, and then they'll use like a larger one during uh, their nesting season. But she. Um, will be able to fit in a smaller hole than you would expect because she is mostly feathers. Yeah, and she only really weighs about like two pounds. She is not very heavy um, because she is very light. She's a bird and they all are um, very, very light in, um, in their anatomy. They have very light bones that are hollow and very fragile and allow them to stay very light so they can fly. Uh, let's see, from Willow, how long do their babies stay with them? That's a really good question. So their babies are usually born, or hatched rather, in, um, in about like end of April, early May. And um, then they will stay with their parents almost completely through the summer. So they will stay with them until probably the end of August, uh, maybe into September a little bit. And at that point, their parents are kind of teaching them how to hunt. They can fly. They can um, hop around. They're, they're learning how to find their own food. But they do stay with their parents for quite a bit of time, most of the spring and summer, uh, because it does take a long time for them to learn how to hunt. Their parents have to teach them how to catch prey. Um, so what they'll do is they'll grab a little mouse, they'll kill it, and then they'll put it in front of the baby and kind of wiggle it around, get the baby to pounce, and then they'll, you know, bring them back a half-dead mouse and get the baby to kill the mouse, and then they'll, the baby will start, um, while it's hopping around on the ground, it will start feeding itself from the ground, and then eventually it'll, it'll go off of, um, it'll go off on its own. So um, they'll kind of disperse and spread out for the rest of the fall. And then um, that baby will be on its own for that first winter. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so Louise, she weighs about two pounds. And Kesh, she does not ever lay us eggs. Sometimes um, birds in captivity do, though they are very rarely fertilized. Um, we do have our broadwing hawk, Gracie, who has in the past laid us a few eggs. Um, which is just due to like hormonal changes, but um, Fern has not, and she has been with us for a little bit, so hopefully um, she, if she was going to, we would have seen it, uh, but it's, you know, never say never, we might see it someday, but they don't usually have babies, they won't usually mate in captivity, um, just because it's such a weird environment. You're falling asleep, Miss Lady, you're so cute. Thank you so much, um, for the sweet words, Kathy, I have a degree in zoology um, from the University of Vermont, and I learned most of the ecology facts about these guys, the specifics about their species on the job. So when I was a volunteer first um, starting out here, I kind of studied their natural histories um, just to make sure that I knew who I was working with. Yeah, she is so precious, Kim. She's so cute. Um, and they are very, very good teachers. Yes, Kathy, the great thing about this is that you can actually get to see her up close. I mean, you would never get to really interact with her so close up um, in person because she wouldn't necessarily let us get super close. But because she is on camera, we can get some really beautiful close-ups. What do you think, Miss Fern? She says, I'm going to go back to sleep now. <laughs> um, thank you guys so much for joining. If you have any other questions about Miss Fern, I would be happy to answer them for you guys. You can see how much fluff she has really, really well when she's looking down like that. That's all fluff. Um, so her, her head is actually like way, way in there. She's, um, her skull is very small compared to the size of her head. And you can also tell that she's kind of molting at the moment. So... Good, good shot, Miss Fern. What are you looking at down there? Is there a little animal under there? Yeah? You see something under the table? No. <laughs> She's like, can I hunt something? Uh, but thank you guys so much for tuning in. We really appreciate you guys watching and being able to con connect with you guys is a fantastic opportunity for us to keep in touch. Um, so definitely let me know if you have any other questions and we'll be back tomorrow with another one of our beautiful ambassadors. Um, Kathy, she does 
sometimes let us touch her. Um, she does tolerate some touching, um, but usually just from her handlers and only when she's in the right mood. She does typically clack her beak to let us know when she doesn't want to be pet. So, uh, but we don't typically do that in public or on camera. She usually doesn't like that. Um, Kara, they do have very long legs. So if you see, that's her foot, but her legs go like all the way up, um, all the way up into her body there, which is kind of hard to tell, but kind of, kind of up. Are you holding up your foot? Are you flamingoing? What are you doing? She's like, I just want to go back to sleep. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching. We really, really appreciate all of you guys tuning in. And we'll see you again tomorrow. Miss Fern, can you look? Hi. Thank you guys. Bye.